So what I've titled my, uh, my comments are whose values and principles in a new biopolitics, uh, tagging that along to the title of this session, which is uh, Reflections on Values and Principles for a New Biopolitics. Uh, first, I want to say it's a real pleasure to be here. I've been very excited about uh, this conference. I canceled a lot of my summer travel, but this I kept on the agenda. I have a very busy fall, but this summer I've been really looking forward to this. We had such a dynamic meeting last year. And this is really a special time for us, the opportunity to come together in such an incredible environment uh, with people that most of us really want to see. So that's really terrific. Uh, and to begin, I want to thank uh, CGS and specifically Rich and Marcy, um, the staff, the multiple Emilies that are involved, uh, Doug uh, and others on the team that have provided the opportunity for us to be here today. So, so we know this session, Reflections on Values and Principles for a New bio Biopolitics. Uh, and I've been given the duty, or shall we say the opportunity, uh, to start us off. And when first approached about the topic, I was really excited about it because I care a lot about values and principles and perhaps even too much to some of my students. They're like, where's the law in the course? We've gotten all this about policy and values and principles. Um, but I think it is really important where we start off here today, and I think even more important whenever one begins the process of thinking about values and principles, we must ask whose values and principles we're actually talking about. Whose values are on the table or on the agenda? And my goal here is to lay the foundation in some ways for my co-panelists and then I guess for, for our table talks afterwards uh, and what will come in the coming um, days. And my comments are in a very brief three-part framework. And the first part of that framework happens to be called definitions and identity. The second, territoriality and caution, and the third, grounding our values and principles in application for a justice agenda. And there I'm concerned about the illusory versus the real. All right, let me get started. Um, before we begin with prescriptions, there are definitional matters that we really do need to attend to. For example, what are the differences between principles and values, and what do these terms actually mean to us? Webster's Dictionary defines principles as truths which are accepted in general, a law of conduct or a rule of action or a law of nature. But which of these or any of these at all should fit our agenda or none? Do we even have a set of truths yet? Can we say that based on last year, meeting each other and getting together, that we actually have a set of truths? Or which of these map adequately on what we think the world should be thinking about. A similar query could be taken up for values, and depending upon what philosophy or social science discipline you consider or adhere to, the ideas that govern what a principle is uh, may synonymously actually define what values are. But here are two working uh, definitions um, that I would like for us to consider. Principle, a rule of conduct and action. We can imagine these as actions that we should commit ourselves to based upon our values. Maybe sort of our version of a primum non nocere, you know, first do no harm. Values, we might consider the following definition. Foundational and enduring beliefs shared by members of a community about what is good, harmonious, and desirable. And coming up with values and principles is, in fact, a tricky enterprise, as I'll continue to describe, because it means navigating the spaces of primary and secondary, the actor and the object, and the difficulty of working within collective groups, which leads me to the second part of my framework. So who's setting the definition in and of itself sometimes is a bit problematic. All right, it's the second matter, territoriality and caution. Before we announce or place on the table the values most essential for an enlightened and sustainable new biopolitic, we must consider whether the territory on which we stand is actually new or only new to us, sort of Columbus-like. 
By this, I mean to suggest that in the West, from time to time, we come to international forums for policy and debate and discussion with the notion that we actually arrived first. And from that vantage point, articulating novel, original, inventive, or innovative ideas, or that is exactly what we think, because we got there first and we're defining it and nobody else has thought of this, so we think. Um, we are in such an era now with climate change, bioprospecting, farming, crops, GMOs, et cetera. I mean, these are all things that people around the globe and for generations have been thinking about, but in some ways we sort of frame our interactions around those as if we got to the table first. So this notion of first place or first placeness presents an obvious danger, and that is blindness, symbolized by our inability to see or perceive others that we claim or purport to help. Because underlying what brings us here and what we seek to do is the fact that we recognize a problem or we wish to ward off a problem. The West has a legacy of prescribing Western thought solutions to, one, situations where there may not be a problem, two, if there is a problem, the locals may in fact be addressing it, and then three, sometimes what also happens is that the conditions that have been caused, have actually been caused by the West, the, the problems, we actually come in and we've, we've created the problem and now we come in to solve the problem, but usually the solutions are those that actually inure benefit back to the West. And so, in fact, we want to be careful about how we approach our problem solving. There is a complex negotiation between paternalism and self-actualization or governance. So perhaps the first value to place into discussion is that of humility. After that, I would place accountability, integrity, and perseverance on the table. And in Q&A, we can talk more about that or on the table because I'm mindful of, of time here. And then third and finally, grounding our values and principles, applications for a justice agenda. Here I'm concerned about the real versus the illusory and that our values cannot just simply live on paper. I'll not belabor what is actually really good about this meeting because there's so much that's good about it um, because I actually want to spend my last moments literally <laughs> thinking about the challenges actually posed by this topic. There's a compendium of values uh, given to you that's in the materials here. And those materials, I mean, there's so much. Do they have the full material that we got? Yes. Dozens of pages, right? And that reflects many years of thinking on similar issues as those that are posed right by this, this gathering, this coming together. What you will notice is the diversity of voices and nations that espouse principles and values that we are very likely to repeat today. So what we come up with today will not be necessarily new values um, at all. And as I considered this, a thought occurred to me, and that is, what have we done with the values and principles that have already been placed on the table, that have come together over time? And by this, I mean to suggest that our values and principles must be lived and not illusory. Next, we must consider where our values and principles should lead us. What are the norms that we actually wish to foster? For example, should we be driven by utilitarianism, notions of formal equality, egalitarianism, relationships, uh, et cetera? Social justice was put on the table, human rights. Finally, and within that context, who are our partners and how do we hold our partners accountable when we may in fact seem to have little accountability ourselves, at least based on our past? And here I'm speaking about colonial relationships. For example, warning parts of Africa and South Africa that they should not grow GMO-based bananas or other crops may seem to be a bit sanctimonious coming from the West. On the other hand, our partners that we seek to foster relationships with or to aid must also be committed to acting on their values and principles. And here's what I mean by that very briefly as I wrap up. The U.S. State Department estimates that in India, for example, there are more slaves in that nation than in any other part of the world, six to eight hundred thousand slaves in India. 
India is a country that has been at the center of farming, biotech, patent kinds of debates. We see a vulnerability year, there, and yet we also see a government that hasn't yet grappled effectively yet with some of its own challenges. The same might be true for China, is true for China, with human rights violations, or as we think about natural resources. You think about a country like Nigeria that uh, holds its citizens captive in many ways. So many of the very sites where, in fact, we want to build relationships or put forth an agenda are places that, too, must, in fact, join on with a vision of principles and a strong commitment to values. I'm over time, and I'm going to stop Thank there. You. Thank you, Marcy.